Beyond the Ranch with Jay Gannon from Find the Ranch. Hello and welcome back to Beyond the Wrench. A quick thank you to everybody who attended our one-year anniversary event for Wrenchway last week. If you weren't able to make it, we gave a sneak peek of our newest tool that is launching next week called Reverse Job Posts. Reverse Job Posts flip the traditional job board around, allowing technicians to create an anonymous post listing their credentials and what they're looking for in a shop. Then shops can reach out to them if they're interested in an interview. You can learn more about reverse job posts on the Wrenchway website. I've also included a direct link to the reverse job post page in our show notes. Next, I uh, want to congratulate Fonda DeCola, who was the winner of our weekly higher or lower game in the Wrenchway mobile app. Fonda had a high score of 41 and won a $100 Amazon gift card. Fonda also got a chance to win our Queen of Hearts pot, but did not turn over the Queen of Hearts. So the pot increases again to $1,400. If you haven't already downloaded our free app, uh, go to anywhere you download apps and uh, download our free Wrenchway app. Uh, In the app, we ask for anonymous feedback on industry topics, and we actually use that feedback to help us choose the topics we cover in this podcast. So download that for free, answer questions, and play our weekly games for a chance to win awesome prizes. This week's prize is a $100 Amazon gift card, and that is sponsored by our great friends at Diesel Laptops. Now, let's dive into this week's episode. This week, we're talking with Jill Trotta, who is a a lot of things for RepairPal, but she's the Vice President, General General Manager of industry sales and certification. Uh, Really enjoyed my conversation with Jill. Everything that she talks about is, uh, I think, relevant to any kind of shop, the importance of training, and uh, and really just uh, brings a high level of insight. So I I, uh, hope you all enjoy this week's episode. Welcome back to Beyond the Wrench. Today, I am really, really excited. I get to welcome my friend, Jill Trotta. Jill is the Vice President GM of Industry Sales and Certification for RepairPal. Did I get that right, Jill? You got that right. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a big title. There's a, there's yeah. a lot of stuff there. There is a lot of stuff that am involved in my position, for sure. <laughs> so uh, as we normally do or typically do on a podcast, I want to, I want to start with, uh, with your background and how you got to where you're, you're at today. Uh, I had a chance to, to sit down and have a beer with you and, and talk about uh, your history. And it was something that I walked away from our conversation just uh, blown away by by your background and, and how you've gotten to where you're at today. So uh, give me an idea of how, how you started off in, in the the car business to start off with and, and uh, how you even got to this point. Yeah, you know, it's been quite a journey. Um, I didn't grow up with cars. Um, my dad was the home mechanic who took apart his car in the garage, couldn't put it back together and would get it towed to the mechanic shop. You know, your favorite customer. <laughs> um, who I tried to do this myself and I realized I can't. This was kind of a consistent theme in our house. Um, you know, although one time he did change the clutch on my um, Toyota Corolla in the parking lot of a gas station because I'd burned it out for like the fifth time. And uh, he got really good at that. <laughs> so That's I went impressive. To college. Yeah, he did. <laughs> You know, he'd had to do it so many times that he actually could execute and do it at by that point. Um, but I went to college and I went to college for recreational therapy and um, working, graduated, started working with therapy teams to um, help plan out people's days when they're in a, a rehab facility. You know, they have speech therapy, they have physical therapy. What do they do with the rest of the time? That was kind of my um, area of expertise. And I owned a Volkswagen bug. Um, 
and I think you probably all know where the story is going. <laughs> and the bug always was breaking down and I wasn't making a lot of money. And I had an uncle or I still have an uncle. And uh, he, at the time he owned um, two auto shops, um, gas station auto shops. And he would, and I asked him to help me fix my car. And he wouldn't if I, unless I paid him because that's what he does for a living. But he did buy me an idiot's guide to Volkswagen repair. And would put me off to the side and give me the things I needed to do, <laughs> needed to work on my car myself. And I started working on myself and, um, and I kind of liked it. And one night, um, I wasn't really liking working um, in recreational therapy and working on the therapy teams. I worked at a geriatric um, psychiatric unit with late stage Alzheimer's and, and, um, I'm just a bit too empathetic for that. Like I just took that all on and I just felt terrible all the time for the, you know, what was going on and decided that that probably wasn't what I should be doing for my life. Um, you know, living in a state of sadness. So I was watching TV one night and this is literally how it happened. And I saw an ad that said, you too can become an automotive technician. And I was like, really? I, <laughs> really? You know what? I probably can so I did, and I completed an 18-month program in nine months because I was used to college. They didn't want um, people to do this program. They wanted people to take longer, and I was like, I already spent four years in college. Last thing I want to do, and I'd actually spent five years in college. Last thing I want to do is, is go back to school for 18 more months. Um, so I ended up... Um, in school, did well, graduated number two in my class, wow. and uh, started out as a technician. That's crazy. And so where, where was the first shop that you worked at? So the first shop that I worked at was a shop um, called Automotion. Well, actually, this was this. That was the second shop I worked at. The first shop I worked at was a Chevy dealer in Los Angeles, in Anaheim, right near Disney. And um, I was the smog tech there. And really? yeah, I did smogs and um, light duty kind of repairs. Um, it was a, I was a, an anomaly because there, there wasn't very many women technicians in the field at that point. And there's still not still very isn't. many women. Yeah. You know, people ask me about that all the time. And I honestly, in the independent shop world, now in the aftermarket um, the work uh, that Women in Auto Care has done has really grown yes. the amount of women in the aftermarket. In the individual shops, I do not believe, and I could be wrong, that there are more female technicians now than there were, I don't want to say this, 30 years ago when I started. <laughs> I can't believe. 30, it, it literally, this year is 30 years. People have asked me how I've been in the field, and I'm like, oh no, 20 or so years, and then I'm like, 30. I feel 30 years. <laughs> Time flies. So, yeah. So I started out there um, and then I moved back to Northern California and um, started in a shop called Automotion, which was one of the women owned shops in the area. Worked there for a while, then went across the bridge back into Oakland and uh, worked for a woman. Um, Pam Spence, who owned a shop at the time calling Fe called Phoenix Auto, super popular woman-owned shop in Oakland, um, worked there for a while, and then got into the dealership world, worked for um, GM for, for a bit, and Honda and BMW, and ended up working for Dine and Engineering, um, one of the um, uh, premier BMW tuners and uh, kind of just screw my career from there. And when I was at Phoenix Auto, um, Pam Spence, who was the owner, sat down with me and said, look, you have a knack for people. You really articulate and you're able to articulate the auto repair in a really approachable manner that a lot of people can't do. And I think you can do it because you didn't grow up in the field. So you you can kind of make it a way that it's approachable for people. So you should work in the front, wow. she said, because when you're 40 years old, you're not going to want to be changing tires. You're not going to want to be doing suspension. You're not going to want to be bent over that car all day. And 
you'll make more money being a service advisor or service manager and then work in fixed ops. She was absolutely correct. And I made that switch. So um, move from being a technician. I still am an AAC certified um, technician and uh, advisor. I get, keep those certifications up for my current position. I stay up on the latest technology. I attend a lot of training. I recently, um, we had a, 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 a subsidiary of RepairPal that did um, direct ADAS and um, programming for shops and, and for our partners. And I learned an incredible amount um, you know, of, of all the up-to-date technology um, that is, is coming into the market. It's, so it's incredible. Kind of where I'm at. Oh, it's incredible. And I've been at RepairPal nine years now. That's, and so let's talk about RepairPal. And what what is RepairPal to those that might be hiding under a rock and not know, uh, what, not know. what, what RepairPal <laughs> is? So RepairPal, you know, start, RepairPal started, um, God, like 15 years ago now, I think. Um, I could be re like slightly wrong. I think 2007, it started. And it started with just the estimator, fair price estimator for consumers to figure out what a fair price for a repair should be. It's grown now into our certified shop network um, that we have over 2,800 shops throughout the country um, that are a part of our network. And these are the best shops. So our... Um, you know, our certification prob pro problem, our certification <laughs> program <laughs> um, really does a good job of sorting out shops who are really investing in the customers and in training and in their staff and doing, you know, what they need to do to make sure that vehicles are fixed right the first time and that they do a good job. So those are the shops that we highlight in our network. We have a whole certification program that they run through. They also agreed to the prices in our estimator. So we, and we stand behind our estimator. So if there's ever a problem um, with a price in the estimator and you're a repair pal certified shop, we work with you and we ask that you um, take care of the customer and we take care of you. And by take care of you, I mean, if we are incorrect in our estimate, we will reimburse you the difference between what you charge the customer and what our estimator said. And then we'll correct the estimator. So it's a really good um, process to kind of, you know, do a holistic check all the way around. Is that looking at data then? Like in terms of, okay, we've got this estimate wrong uh, five times mm -hmm. or something like that. And then being able to kind of real life go yeah. back and look at it. Yeah. Yeah, and then we submit actually to our data providers, to the shop that, or to the company that provides the, the labor times and parts prices for our estimator. We submit that information to them. And then in the next quarterly update, they update the information. So we use Motor, um, you know, that's no secret. So then Motor uses our information to update it. Um, throughout their system, which is a really good process because, you know, motor drives the back end of, of a lot of different uh, um, data providers. Yeah, and they've been around forever. Uh, they, they, they've been around <laughs> forever, and it's yeah. probably the most comprehensive, um, accessible um, database um, for times and, and parts pricing um, available right now. So yeah, it's, well, it's a good thing. And so a shop signs up, they go through a certification process. What, what is kind of entailed in that certification process? So what we do is we check out to make sure that the technicians are current on their training. That is, a, if, if, you, if they haven't attended training in the last year, you know, some classes will go back two years depending on what the, um, what the content is. But training is huge. Yeah. If you're not attending ongoing training, you can't be a part of our network. The only way to circumvent that is if you're ASC certified in um, at least, I think it's four areas, but those areas are like, um, they you have to have an L1 mm -hmm. that, you know, if you have an L1, you know, we can kind of talk, but the other are like the electrical area, your HVAC area, your engine performance area, like brakes and suspension, that won't get you there. That can be mixed in with the other um, higher level skills, but it's got to be there. And if it's not there, then we do have resources that will work with you and we can provide you with resources to get that training. Um, but 
you have to be committed to that. So the, the shop has to be investing in that. They need to be investing in the tools and equipment that they need. They have to have a high level scan tool um, to be a part of our network. If you don't have one, I don't know how you do business these days. Some yeah. shops don't have them and I don't quite understand how they even function without one, but some shops do. I mean, makes life you know, really hard. we have probably, yeah, yeah. we've, evaluated i th i think at last count last year over seven thousand shops um you know in the in the years we've been doing it um so we have a pretty good idea about what people <laughs> are doing you have to have a computerized shop management system and uh you know the right processes in place the right people in place and we do a um survey of your most recent customers just to make sure that they're happy and that there's no big problems there. Wow. You know, once you pass through all that, um, it you, you can be listed in our network. So what kind of training? Uh, is it, it's, I'm assuming technical based, but then is it, uh, does it have to meet certain criteria in order for you to count it as training? Yeah, so we look for drivability training. We look for electrical training. We look for training that a master tech would be looking for. And over 50% of the people in, in a location have to have been attending those trainings. We understand there's new people that come in and you know they're training under the higher level tech. So that's why we say over 50% of the people um, in the shop need to have that training. Okay. And the one thing, and, and we've noticed this uh, obviously through the Wrenchway side, and we've come up with a pretty cool partnership with RepairPal uh, through Wrenchway. And I think as you and I spoke, Jill, and we've gotten to know the RepairPal folks in general, um, just a, a really, really good company, a lot of really, really good people. And um, you know, I think a lot of our values align. One of the things that I think we both have a unique perspective on is being able to see kind of a wide variety of shops mm -hmm. and seeing the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? Like, oh, and yeah. I think there's, there is a variance, right? And that's, you know, for us, it's really, really important because when we tell a technician about a, a, a place to go work, we want to make sure it's a good place to go work. Yeah. Like we, we don't, we don't want to send them to some place that they're going to be miserable at. So uh, when, when you're looking at this, what what do you see out of the best shops? Like so, obviously you're certifying that they're they're great. Training is a big piece of that. Is that I mean, is that an indicator to how successful or how good a shop is in general? Absolutely. I mean, the training that a technician has to do today to be successful, you know, is akin to a master's degree. Like somebody who has a master's degree, the amount of technical expertise that is required now to work on cars is is really i mean it's, insane. it's, it's so it's insane um i've been through a lot of that training more recently with our um subsidiary that we had we recently um you know stopped stopped uh, shut down operations for that but the amount that I learned really gave me a lot of insight into what's coming, particularly in the ADAS um, area and the amount of expertise in that area that is going to be required mm -hmm. and the amount of unknowns in that area that still exist. Like we don't even know what we don't know. <laughs> and I learned that, um, you know, in big ways. And with the ADAS it introduces a new level of, of liability. Yes. Yes. Big time. And I, the funny part with me is I'm just getting familiar with ADAS myself. Right. And, and really being able to kind of dive into it a little bit. It, to me, when, when we talk about training and the importance of, of prioritizing training, one of the things I equate it to is like when you go through your lifespan in school and uh, if you don't have that good foundation in first and second grade and third grade, you know, you're, you're building, you're building, you know, your knowledge yeah. as you go up through school, it's kind of turning into the same thing here, right? You've got to, you've got to start with that foundation of a base level of knowledge and then keep building onto that, right? You absolutely do. Because when you figure 
um, when you look at the ADAS systems, they're tied into the brakes. They're tied into the cruise control. They're tied into the acceleration of the vehicle. They're tied into just about every system in the vehicle. So if you don't understand the systems, you're not going to be able to understand the higher level tasks that are going to be involved in the integrations that are involved into those systems. It's just not going to happen. And really, it's, it's kind of scary, the amount of liability and what shops are holding in their hands. And, you know, it, <laughs> it's yeah. just kind of mind boggling. It is. And uh, when you're talking about the safety of a family that could be in that minivan uh, that, you know, has an ADAS fault, uh, you know, that's, that's a big deal. There's, there is a lot that goes into that. So when you, when you look at this from a shop's perspective, I think it's really easy to get overwhelmed by this topic, right? And when I say mm -hmm. that, you know, all of this new stuff that's coming, uh, not everybody has unlimited resources, right? So being able to, to prioritize and figure out, okay, what is it that I need to get our staff up to speed on? Because it, you know, and maybe in some levels you're coming from behind, right? Where you're, you're you know, haven't been doing a great job prioritizing training. Any, any thoughts on that of like how, how do you get this to not just consume your life and like fall behind fast? <laughs> I, mean, I think, you know, I always think of the saying, um, how do you eat an elephant? Like one bite at a time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just creating a training plan for your shop. You know, partnering with one of the big training providers. There's some training providers out there who are doing great stuff. There is. You know, partnering with a training provider and really making an aggressive plan to make sure that your staff is up to date. Yeah, I, I agree. I, you know, I think when you do feel that overwhelming sensation of like, oh my goodness, we're behind on this. We need to get caught up. I think being able to kind of take a step back and just write out, you know, or, or even look at opportunities that are out there. You know, I, I talk about my dad's little shop up here in Wisconsin all the time. And one of the things that I, I told them, you know, they were getting kind of behind on training. And I said, you know what, set a budget, you know, start with a budget. Like what can you spend this year on training and, you know, make it aggressive and then start to find training and start to like, start to build your people up because, yeah. It's just, I don't think this is something you want to sit, sit on your hands with right now, because if you do in five years, I mean, can you imagine in five years where we're going to be at? You're going to be obsolete. I mean, yes. I think we're going to see like, so right now we have the technician in shortage and people who are not up to speed. I think what we're going to see, and, and we're kind of seeing it right now, and we can see it in our attrition rate. And our number one reason for shops dropping out of our network is closing business. That's mm. the number one reason. Um, I think we're going to see the industry shrink, but we're going to have better qualified shops because the shops who are not qualified and not keeping up are going to cease to exist or they're going to become like those um, shops that only do classic cars. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that turn away a large part of the work because they just can't. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, they're not up to speed with it. And I think that's okay. <laughs> I, it's funny to me because I, I watched a video on YouTube a few weeks ago, and I don't even recall who it was from, but it talked about the shop of the future and how, it, you know, it almost looked like a laboratory more than mm -hmm. a, a traditional repair shop. And I, I feel like there's some level of, you know, truth to that, where it is, you know, if you're, um, if you're diving into uh, diagnostics and the ability or need to be clean and not have, you know, a bunch of crap around <laughs> wires or computers. And, and I, I just think the dynamic of our industry is changing like by the hour, it feels like it just, it is oh, yeah. changing so fast. Honestly, you know, I've been at RepairPal nine years and I think probably in the last six or seven years, there's been more change in the industry than in my previous 
25, 24 years. Yes. I think it, it's changing rapidly. And, you know, you talk about it looking like a lab, like I had the pleasure of setting up an, an ADAS calibration station. And it very much looked like a lab because it, it mattered what color the walls were, the lighting mattered, any, any um, you know, stray light, the amount of distance mattered, the amount of, you couldn't have metal <laughs> in certain air, you know? So it was pretty much like a very sterile looking environment um, to do these calibrations um, correctly. And a lot of people, um, I've toured and visited a lot of other facilities and people aren't doing it like that. I'm kind of risk averse. So yeah. if they say that you can't have this extra light, like I'm not gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get rid of the light. We're not just gonna soldier on. Um, just because, uh, you know, the amount of liability and, and you've got people's lives in your hands. Oh. So you, you don't want to be messing with that. Just, you know, um, radar sensors on the front of the car that are miscalibrated just by like hundreds of an inch. That can translate like 100 feet down the road to 10 feet, which can put you in another lane. I mean, there's so much to it that if you are not up to date, like you just aren't going to be able to go on. How... Any idea, like, so if there's a shop out there that is looking at, like, okay, this this ADAS thing is, like, kind of that elephant that we're talking about, I, I, any idea on, like, what's it cost to get, like, the calibration software that, like, I mean, it, there's, there's, there's a lot it's, of cost in it, right? There is a lot of cost in it. You know, your basic ADAS kits are up, up in the neighborhood of 50, 60,000 and more. I haven't looked wow. up what the newest one was, but... We had um, we had a kit that was a couple of years old and it was getting obsolete. There were kits coming out Scary. that were much better. And this was only like a two year, like I think it was actually even only like 18 months. And I was, you know, in, in deciding whether to go forward or not, one of the big things was cost because I was, you know, when I put all the cost together for the ADAS and for all the programming and the security stuff that we were going to have to do, um, you know, we're looking at hundred thousand dollars a year to maintain that equipment and to keep it going. And, and a, a regular shop cannot uh, afford that. That's why, you know, you're going to see a lot of standalone ADAS and, and, um, programming businesses, uh, um, pop up. I think there's one in your neck of the woods, um, out there that is doing yeah. a, a pretty good job, um, with that. Well, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's adding an, an entirely different element. And if you, you yeah. know, if you're a shop, it probably makes a lot more sense to contract that out rather than, um, you know, invest that money unless you're like that, that when it's that hard to stay on top of it, you know, that's the hardest part is the changing technology yeah. and how, how do you keep your shop profitable uh, when you're, yeah. you know, when you're investing in all of that. But what it uh, does do is it opens up um, a whole nother, uh, you know, line of avenue of business that um, shops, I don't think, I think some work with body shops, um, but not a lot. And I know that body shops, because we were working with the body shop, they have to do a pre-scan when those vehicles come in. And I think that's something we're going to have to start doing in the automotive um, aftermarket for mechanical as well. Pre-scan the vehicle when it comes in and make sure that there are no ADAS codes when it comes in. Wow. And if there are, then address them. So every a body shops now have to do that. You know, you figure they want to know what exists before and what exists after. But I can tell you from experience that you might not even know there's ADAS codes in there and there could be. You know, I, on my own vehicle, we had a company vehicle, it was a, um, a Lexus and I was driving it and I thought the car didn't have rear cross traffic alert, which I thought was kind of weird because my other Toyota did and why wouldn't this Lexus have it? Well, it did, but it was disabled because the car had, something had happened to it and it shut that system off and I didn't know it was shut off. I, I could have looked through the system, but it didn't throw a light. So I didn't think to go look through. Oh and when we put it on just as a test, we found that that was in fact disabled. And we, you know, recalibrated it and turned it back on and it worked. But 
um, you know, I'm in the automotive industry. I understand these things and I still didn't know that. I didn't know that that, you know, was but that's the importance so. of training right there, right? Is like, mm-hmm. you, even like if that's something that if you're not familiar with ADAS systems that you're not going to know. That, you're not going to know. Right. Yeah. And that's, you know, when we, when we look forward to why training is important, I think, I think it's going to be, like you said, the ones that don't prioritize training are going to not be around. They're not going to be around anymore. That's, I mean, that's it. For those of you listening out there, I think if that doesn't hit home, I, I don't know what else will, you know, that's, that is how important training is right now. Like if, if you don't do it, there's a chance in five years, you're not around. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. But that's, that's, I mean, that's just a given. I, I, so to me, this is such a, when, when shops look at this and they're looking at ROI of training, and I think they're, you know, maybe looking at what is that immediate ROI? What are we going to get back? Uh, when we send somebody to training, are they going to come back and, and do ADAS uh, calibrations on everything when they get back? Or maybe not even ADAS, but just general electrical diagnostics and uh, different types of training. How does that equate to a better customer experience? And, you know, I, I, like, I think training sometimes is a little hard to see immediate ROI. You can see it in a big picture once you look back, but do you see kind of that immediate impact on, on maybe a customer's experience with a shop? I mean, absolutely. Because fixing cars right the first time is something like our industry, like that's, they need to be fixed right the first time. Yeah. When, uh, and the training helps you to do that. You have to, I, you know, the lifetime value of a customer is important. And if they come in in their first experiences, you didn't fix their car right the first time, not they're not going to come back. That's going to be a difficult situation to overcome. Well, and, and I think, you know, I do, yeah, I do all of our um, radio and, and TV stuff for Repair Pal. And they often, often, they always ask me, what's the cheapest way to get your car fixed? And I always say, write the first time by somebody who knows what they're doing. That's the cheapest way to get your car fixed. So you want to be that shop that does it right the first time. How, so when when that question gets asked, I think one thing that we've battled as an industry is maybe in, I do look at maybe part stores as somewhat of a piece of the problem here in terms of uh, promoting that, hey, you know what, come in, we'll hook up a scan tool and we'll tell you what's wrong and you can buy parts from us and we're, you know, it's easy as pie to, to go do this. Do you think that kind of, that hurts the shops from, from being able to really show their expertise? And, and, uh, and one, I think when they do that, they end up throwing parts at a car and oh yeah here you need no two sensor here's all three (laughs) (laughs) yeah take all three of these put them on and it should be fine yeah no i mean i think it doesn't do anybody any good you know i get a ton of people like hey you know i'm just gonna pull the code and then it'll tell me what's wrong with my car and i'm like no 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 it won't tell you what's wrong with your car it will point you in the direction of a problem and you know i'm like in the case of an o2 sensor code you could have a vacuum leak you could have a catalytic converter problem there could be all these it might it's maybe it's the o2 but maybe not and once right. you buy it and you put it in you own it <laughs> It's easy money for a part store. Uh, and that's the, I, the frustrating part, I think, is that piece right there. Is we, and I've had other podcast guests where we've talked in depth about that piece where it's just like, we've got to show our value to, to customers and show, you know, for me, I see a tech doing a diagnostic process in a shop and I see a really, really brilliant person. Like I see somebody mm-hmm. that is just a bright person and when we do stuff like that, I think we under, we undercut ourselves in the industry and it just, it, it is really, really frustrating. Cause I, I think it, it, yeah. it takes credibility away from, you know, all of the training that, that 
that technician does, you know, there it's, it's not just taking a class and then being like, all right, I'm done. I know everything about this. You just have to keep going and going and going. Yeah, no, it's, uh, <laughs> it's definitely, it, it's, it's one of the biggest problems is, is perception, perception mm-hmm. about a lot of things, perception about the people and the, the caliber of the people that are working in the automotive industry. You know, I tell people now, like, Everybody thinks like being an engineer and a software design designer are like these big sexy things. I'm like, being a technician is harder. There are more systems, there are more processes, there's more at stake. And I know, you know, you think that this isn't like this highly educated person, but it really is. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I um during my earlier years at repair pal now I attend a good amount of training but in the beginning like just keeping up like I was attending hundreds of hours a year of training I would go to the training and just make sure that I was up to date because if we're going to be evaluating shops I need to know like I need to be on their like to to maintain my my knowledge base on their level so that you can go in and have those conversations and it's intense. And I'm like, I don't know anybody else who is working and attends that many trainings a year. Like it just doesn't happen. No, no, it really, really doesn't. And as we move forward and technology evolves, uh, that's, uh, I can't state highly enough why that training is so important. And, and I think when I look at the best of the best, and when I look at the best technicians that are out there, the best shops, um, the best technicians to me, they're the ones that are, they're looking for training on their own. Like they're, they're out, like, mm-hmm. even if the shop's not doing it for them, they're not expecting yep. that the, the shop is just going to do everything. They're looking for articles to read, uh, blogs to read, uh, podcasts yeah, to listen to. It's you know, constant. Yes. Yes. They're going above and beyond even what the shop is doing. Yep. Because technology is changing so rapidly. So I own right now a 2021 Toyota Mirai, which is their fuel cell vehicle. Mm. And I mean, it's an incredible piece of machinery that I really don't even understand. It has a fuel cell and it converts hydrogen into power that charges the battery. So it's an electric vehicle. So that, you know... um, yeah, that uh, that's the thing, but I don't I don't fully understand. My my wife is a physicist, and she has explained this how this works. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wow, like this is you know we just I just call it the hydrogen rocket. Like we're going. <laughs> well, it it I mean I think we took it for granted for so long that you just hop in your car, turn the key, and you go and. Uh, as technology goes, you have no idea, or most of the general consumer has no idea how many computers a car has and how many, you know, like just the communication that goes on in a car every second, uh, you know, it, it's just, yeah, you know, it's just the way I mean, I'm rolling around them. with five pounds of hydrogen. <laughs> <laughs> how, out of curiosity, how, How's the drive of drivability with it? Like, it, oh, I love any difference? it. It is yeah. the best car that I've ever owned. I mean, it's an electric vehicle, right? Sure. Um, so it it runs like an electric vehicle. It you know it gets almost four hundred miles to the tank. Wow. Um, you know, it's a pretty incredible piece of machinery. But I do sit around and think like, because there's not a lot of training out there for that because that's the brand new technology and there's only a few vehicles on the road and it's only really in California. Yeah. And uh, so I roll around and I think about like, how does this work? Like, how does, how is it? I'm just exchanging this and then that's charging the battery. And then. (laughs) Somebody way smarter than I came up with that. There's zero chance I would have came up with that. That is, uh, that is impressive. That is impressive. So we we've talked about why, why training is important, where, where should shops look for training opportunities? Like where are some good spots to where, um, you know, if, if you're, say you're trying to become a repair pal certified shop and you know that you've got to step up your training side, where are some good, good uh, opportunities for training? 
you know, there's so many of them out there, depending mm-hmm. on what you want. Like the big training events are great. Like, you know, your vision, your world pack, um, SPX, your, the Napa expo is coming up. Um, you know, AVI, they have their training event that's at Apex. You, there's so many good in-person events, but there's also really good online providers. You have, you know, um, World Pack does great online training. Um, TechNet has it. Um, AVI, we, we, we work with AVI. Yes. Um, you know, there's so, Garage Gurus, there's so many out there that are doing really good quality virtual training it's not like it used to be you know one of the things that we do at repair pal is if a shop doesn't pass we have training for the shop um, that they can they can use and we let them use it for free and, and we give we sign them certain class and they go through it and once they pass we also have a test out option that's akin to the um, l1 that you can take and and to to show your knowledge but just super important to do something <laughs> yes yes do not <laughs> sit do on your hands something when we first, yeah you know we've evolved because when we first um set up the program that we where we offer training to shops we used a different platform and that platform was fine um but the evolution of what's available now because we started that like four years ago is incredible so now we've migrated to a new platform that is great that's that's cool. So uh, when, when we talked about it being overwhelming, and I think even that part can be kind of overwhelming too, right? Because I think for a shop, when you're looking at the variety or the breadth of different training options available, uh, where do you even start, right? I, I think yeah. that's, a, that's a challenge, right? Because you, you know, if you go one route, you're probably going to stick with that route you know, for a while uh, because you know the, the program is there a way to understand what the best one for you is uh, or is it just kind of looking and seeing what you're comfortable with? I think it's looking and seeing what you're comfortable with. Like, are your technician, are you, are you willing to invest the money to send your technicians to a live event? I think live events are great. They mm-hmm. provide networking. They can, um, you know, you, they make, you make friends with other technicians who are doing the same thing. And then you have, people you can bounce things off of. I think those are really good, but can be really expensive. You know, you're talking about housing somebody and traveling, and but there's also really good online platforms that are, have, have um, evolved to very interactive platforms. And those are less expensive and, and can be done from anywhere and you don't have to travel for them. So I think, you know, talking to your people, I think one of the biggest things is sitting down and doing a really honest evaluation Mm -hmm. of the skill level of your technicians is important. And because if you're honest and you sit down and you, and you have this really honest conversation about what the skill gaps are, then, then it becomes easier to figure out what you need to do to fill those gaps. Well, and I think that you hit that on the head where having those one-on-one conversations to even understand where they want to go at with their career too. Mm -hmm. You may have that young tech that is enamored by ADAS or some advanced diagnostics, but really hasn't been able to shine yet because they're on the Lubrac or, (laughs) you know, something like that. And, and, you know, allowing them time to play in and be able to get familiar with something when there's not, you know, the bright lights on you and you're, you're yeah. trying to bill out hours, right? Like, I think that's, there's a, there's a huge level of importance with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think you're going to see specialization. You're going to see um, technicians who just do ADAS calibrations or who just do programming. Yeah. I, it, it, as these get more and more complex, I don't know how you're going to be able to master everything. Like it's, it's uh, the specialization that you're already seeing it, I think in a, in a lot yeah. of shops. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what uh, it, it, so say you, you have those one-on-one conversations with a tech or you sit down and you're really evaluating technicians. One of the, one of the exercises that I used to do was I would list out every technician that worked for me And then I would put Mm -hmm. a kind of a designation of what I thought their like top (laughs) three strengths were, and then align that with, you know, what training they had had. And 
the cool part about that exercise was that it would open my eyes pretty frequently to be like, okay, well, Johnny just went to this training. Uh, so he doesn't need that. And then I'd go back and look, I'm like, oh no, that was, that was four or five years ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Time flies Time really fast. So quickly. It does. It does. You're like, oh my goodness, we just sent them to a training and it actually was five years ago. So I, I think mm -hmm. doing an exercise like that consistently where you can lay out your, your training, see the history. Uh, one, one thing that I'm curious on is how do you organize a training history? Um, so, so for instance, if I were to put together my training history and I wanted to send it to repair pal, um, and maybe not even just necessarily to send it to repair pal, but I want to have a snapshot of everybody's training at hand, but we use all of these different platforms and they've got all of their certifications out on their separate platforms. Any, any thoughts as to how to organize those? Personally, how I organize mine actually is I drop them into my LinkedIn Ah. So I just keep a running tally in my LinkedIn. I know a lot of technicians don't have that, but in my shop, what I would do is I had a filing cabinet and I kept everything in a file that I had paid for, for them. And then they could provide me, like I would have their resume in there. So in their employee file, I would just keep a running, um, you know, running list of what they needed. I would also do a review of all the comebacks that the shop had in the in the previous like you know I, I would do that monthly when I, when I worked in independent shops just to see like is it a attention to detail issue or is it a training gap that you know if it's a attention to detail issue that's one problem but if it's a training gap that's your problem I don't even see that as the technician's problem that's your problem if you're not providing that for them that's a great point that's a great point. Isolate what the actual problem is and then try to attack it that way. And, yeah, you know, let the data speak, right? Because if the data is telling you that it's, you know, this, we've got a problem with this specific repair, or it's just taking way too long for electrical diagnostics in general, and we're having to write off time or, you know, whatever it is, uh, that can, that can point oh, yeah. you in the direction pretty easily. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love the saying, in God we trust everybody else bring data. <laughs> I love that too. Looking at the data and just kind of trying to figure out like what exactly the problem is. And, you know, when we do um, our customer survey um, as a part of our uh, certification process, what we do is I, we really look at the reviews and what people said, and you can identify the problem. Is it like a communication problem? Is it you know, a lot of them, we get them obviously on overcharging, but is it really, you know, a chart, a problem where the shop is overcharging? It usually isn't. It's usually a communication issue. Mm. So I think really evaluating comebacks and, and calls and all that, like, is the most, one of the most useful things you can do as a shop owner. Well, how important is that then too, that your service writers and service managers are trained po properly, right? Because if mm -hmm. they're not writing up the work, in a way that explains it, the customer oh, yeah. feels then like the they got ripped off, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the technician's not going to get the correct information. And then the car's not going to, you know, you're not going to address everything that the customer said. And you could do a whole engine job. And if you didn't address the rattle in the back, you, you didn't do anything. I, um, I say I, I used to work for a John Deere dealership and we had one of the largest claims, like warranty claims in John Deere's history. And it was a hydro went off and it blew through all the lines. And it was like over a hundred thousand dollar warranty claim. And the amount of detail we had to have in that write-up was insane because you had to, I mean, it was down to the, down to the nut and bolt of what we were doing because we didn't want them to come back and say, Hey, listen, no, you didn't do this right. Uh, you're, you know, you're responsible for this hundred thousand dollars. We're like, Oh no, <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> that tells you how important those write-ups mm -hmm. are. And that was from a warranty standpoint, but you know, I think that's something, I think it leads into this next question really, really well is that how do you, how do you prioritize or evaluate and maybe we kind of already answered this, but the need for soft skills training versus the technical training, right? And, and that could be something like a technician doing a good write-up 
Um, you know, maybe they are really good at their job. They're just not good at telling other people what they did. Yeah. And I mean, I, that's a huge issue. You know, that is a big issue because technicians know the car, but being able to articulate it is super important. We ran into that a lot when we were doing the ADAS calibrations because we were working a lot with insurance companies who don't want to pay. So the amount of documentation that we had to do, including taking pictures of every single setup. So when you're setting the lasers up, taking pictures of all of it, just because if there was ever a problem and God forbid there was ever an accident as a result of it, you wanted to be able to prove that you were, um, you, you set it up right and that it wasn't something that you did. And the documentation that the technicians had to do was very extensive and very detailed. We actually got to where we created doc, doc documentation because, and they would just, we, we had the verbiage and they would just cut and paste it just because, um, you know, they, they could articulate it, but like myself, like I'm not a great writer. If I have to write up something really, really, you know, that I want it to be a certain way, it's going to take me a little bit. I can do it. It's going to take me a little bit. I'm the same way. And I think that's where, you know, even when shops look for efficiencies in ways to do things, and if you have a common repair, kind of having that menu to, to do the write-ups that way uh, can be really, really helpful. Um, lastly, what, uh, how does a shop get a feel for their ROI on training? Like, uh, it, and it, I think this is a hard question to, to answer because I don't know that there's, you know, I think, like I said, you can look in the rear view mirror and see the impact that it had maybe over the course of a year and that you were able to improve your diagnostic process and do some of that. But are there opportunities to look at uh, immediate ROI when it comes to training or is it just, a, it's kind of, you gotta, you gotta give it some time. I think you just got to give it some time. I mean, you're going to see immediate wins, things fix faster. Um, you might see a bump in the amount of hours a technician is flagging, things like that. I think in the longer term, your customer attention score is going to go up because you're not going to have as many problems. You're going to be able to fix the cars faster, maybe an increase in car count. Those are the kind of things that I would expect a shop that is investing a lot in training um, is going to see. Well, and I think there's a lot to be said about technician retention too, because mm -hmm. technicians, like I said before, the best ones that I've seen really crave training. They want to learn about systems and they want to learn how things work. And uh, if you're starving them of that, I think they're going to be looking for other opportunities uh, because they, yeah. they want to learn. They want to improve their and craft. They want to right? fix the cars, right? Like yes. fixing a car is a big win. And that's like a big bump for the day that like makes you happy that, you know, you're able to fix it. And yeah. the amount of frustration on the other end that happens if you can't fix it. I know for me, like um, I'll keep trying. <laughs> yeah. It's hard. And, to, it's hard. It's hard, it's to, hard stop, to give right? up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it, you're not going to let it beat you. You just keep going and going. But you know, overall, I think everything we've talked about today is uh, points to training being an absolute no-brainer, right? Like, there's no reason not to do training. And even if you're worried about like short-term money, that kind of thing, I think you're focused on the wrong area. You know, obviously you need to stay in business and you need to do whatever you can to stay in business, but the work for most shops is there right now. Um, I, mm -hmm. I don't see it, very it's many incredibly shops. incredibly busy out there right now. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody wants technicians. I think they, they prefer that they get somebody come in that's fully trained and they're ready to go, but that's not always going to happen. And even those folks, you have to continually train them. You have to, you know, coach them, train them, get them into, mm -hmm. you know, opportunities to, to be successful. And as, as our industry progresses at a level that none of us have ever seen before, um, I, it just, if, if you don't, you're going to become extinct really, really fast. Yeah. yeah. No, you, you totally are going to become extinct and nobody's going to want to work there. 
Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the main things that shop owners tell me is why they don't invest in training. And they tell my certification this team this all the time is if they invest in training, then they'll go somewhere else and somebody else will get the benefit that technicians, they don't stay, they move. So why are you going to train them? Cause they're just going to go somewhere else. And that's like, I would, you know, if, if, if that was words that had come out of my mouth, I would hope somebody would tell me, then you need to look at the culture in your shop. You need to look at maybe how much you're paying them. You need to look at why they're leaving because changing jobs is a pain in the butt. Yes. It, it, it Especially is. for a tech, like you gotta move for your tech, toolbox. You it's not like, all your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fun. Uh, no, no. And that's, I, I love that. And I think that's, if you have that perspective, you need to look in the mirror a little bit because that's, there's something more, uh, to that thought more, process. But... Yes. And I'm sure you've been burned before. I think we all have at some level oh, yeah. and you just can't let that control your life because if you do, that's not, it's not going to be a healthy way to live. <laughs> it just not yeah. having trust in anybody. Um, I, uh, it, it's a, it's a tough way to be. Yeah. I think you have to check in. You have to make sure people are happy. Like, you know, I work with my team in one of the last things I always ask them in their one-on-one is what can I do for you to make your job, to make you more successful? Like that is my job is to make you successful. So what do I need to do to help you to become more successful and, and follow through on some of those things provided that, you know, you're able to. Well, that's why you're the best, Jill. You, you, you uh, you're making everybody better. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, I have that's good examples I, in my what? organization of that. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, what, Kathleen, like she, uh, yes. she's that, uh, she, she is the master of that, of, um, you know, we're really working with her people and bringing up really junior people into, um, so I have a oh, great, she's, uh, she's a rock star too. You have a bunch of yeah. rock stars at repair pal, uh, really, really good people as I, I let off the podcast with, and, uh, it's been a pleasure to get to know you and, and your team. And, uh, you know, I just, uh, I, I value our, relationship and our partnership, you know, kind of newly found partnership here. I think uh, yeah. it's, it's cool to be aligned with with other companies that have kind of the same uh, drive and the same kind of values and, and really want to see the the industry improve. So I, uh, I commend you and, and all of RepairPal on that. Oh, thank you. I'm, uh, it's been, RepairPal has been the highlight of my career. I've worked at a lot of places. I love RepairPal. I've been here nine years now. Um, you know, started out as something that was a great idea. And now like we're a company that delivers real value to shops. That's pretty cool. At the end of the day, that's yeah. what it's all about, you know, trying to deliver that value. And it's, uh, it, it's tough, but I, I, you know, you guys have done a great, great job at it. Uh, yeah. One, one last thing I've got to ask is what is this Yoda quote on the wall behind oh. you? Oh, <laughs> do or do not, there is no try. I like yeah. that. That's, so I was never a Star Wars person, um, and I, uh, my son, I've got a four-year-old, and he is obsessed right now. Uh, so I, I'm learning a ton about it right now, and uh, and it's pretty cool. I I never in a million years would have thought I would have been a uh, been been a watching Star Wars. Uh, Star, Star Wars, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love yeah. Star Wars. I have little odes to Star Wars, like very subtle things throughout the house that people who know Star Wars get. <laughs> All right. Well, as yeah. I as I go on this Star Wars journey right now, there you uh, go. I'll I'll try to uh, I'll keep you in mind uh, for <laughs> for those. But uh, but thank you for being on the podcast, Jill. We know your 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 time is uh, uh, is really, really highly in demand. And, and we appreciate you taking some time out of your day to, uh, to join us and, and talk about training and, and uh, talk about repair pal. Oh yeah. Anytime. These are my favorite things to do. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, take care. We'll be talking to you. I'm sure sometime soon. All right. Have a good one. Thank you.